certainly good to see everyone out and good to be here with you. It's always a privilege to share God's Word with you. And if you're logging into Facebook or onto YouTube a little later on, it's good to have you here visiting with us today. I'm certainly happy to have you here as well. Uh, I was watching a little bit of the uh, Cincinnati Reds pregame show yesterday uh, before I went out to work after I had eaten some lunch and uh, one of the commentators on there was talking about how the Reds team needed to focus on their main purpose. And he went on to expand that it was kind of, it seemed kind of elementary at first. He said, first you have to win, your focus is on winning the game. And then your focus after that is on winning your division. And then the championship, and then ultimately the World Series. And I thought, well, his name was Sam LaCour, and I said, yeah, Sam, that's, that's pretty much the gist of baseball. But he, he went on to explain that sometimes that we lose f focus on the beginning because we're looking to the end and we forget what's in the middle. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good analogy. And I began to wonder, I thought, well, I wonder about us as the church. Do we do that sometimes? Do we, do we lose focus on the end by, by forgetting the stuff in the middle? So if I surveyed the average congregation about what the primary purpose or focus of the church would be, I would imagine it would be several different answers, uh, diverse answers. There would be several common answers, I'm sure. But that's what I want to look at this morning, and the title of this morning's sermon is Focused on Our Purpose. Focused on Our Purpose. We're going to look at several different scriptures this morning. In relation to that, we'll begin in the Gospel of John, if you want to turn there with me, John 13, 35. And we'll look at the words of Jesus here. He says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have what? Love one to another. Fellowship. Some might ask, if asked what's the main purpose of the focus of the church, is, is fellowshipping. Uh, with one another, being a support to one another. And certainly I can't disagree with that. Uh, love can be displayed through fellowship and oftentimes is. A uh, large number of people may think that. Uh, There's an opportunity to associate, and we, we do that well here, I think. Our, our uh, homecoming dinner that we had I thought was really nice. Uh, Always, anytime we have a homecoming or a, a dinner or anything, we have, have a good turnout. And it's a good fellowship. It's good for, for uh, encouraging one another. And certainly uh, that is a good thing to do. It's uh, highly valued as an activity among the church. And folks that value this fellowship also for programs for the whole family. Uh, it's a place where relationships in this fellowship can be nurtured. It's a place where they can share with each other, uh, where we can give inspiration to each other. Uh, good preaching and good music as well, oftentimes. I believe fellowship is important. It's important for the body of Christ to come together. Ernie mentioned that, uh, to forsake not the assembling of yourselves. Of course, we're talking about church services, but I believe that's any time the body is called together, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Fellowship included. Uh, when we just have a time of fellowship, because it helps us to, to forge those common bonds, the common bonds based on Christ as our Savior, strengthens our relationships with each other. But fellowship, I think you would agree, is not the main purpose of the church. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writing here uh, is talking about sound Bible preaching and teaching. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, uh, talking about having a unity of the Spirit. But here he teaches us that he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some and teachers for the perfecting of the saints or the equipping as some of your translations may say the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man 
unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, sound Bible preaching and teaching. Most of those things that he talks about there, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those are all so that we can uh, have sound teaching, sound preaching as well. But is this the church's principal function of expounding the scriptures, strengthening believers? It's important, certainly, isn't it? About knowledge and obedience, about God's revealed truth. That emphasis would include helping believers, helping non-believers discover and, and discover a ministry, a ministry talent that they may have, uh, as we see here, teaching the young so that they might know the truth. And we know that as well. We do that through our vacation Bible schools. We do that through our Sunday schools. Though I will have to say not so much for our youth here at this church in the past. And that's something that, I, that though I am encouraging us to do is to look at and examine these functions of our church. Do we value so little giving an extra hour study of, to our children of the Bible and God's love for them that we have decided that Sunday school for children are no, is no longer relevant. Don't, I'm sorry, not really. I'm not. Because that's why we come together is to lift up, teach, preach, encourage our children. Teach the young so that they might know the truth. Remember what I said that last week, create an environment where they would gain an understanding of God's love for them. That's the environment that I hope that we continue to create here. Absolutely sound Bible teaching and preaching are both essential in the New Testament church. No doubt about it. A church that follows the doctrine of Jesus Christ as he taught the disciples. As Ernie mentioned during... Uh, his communion meditation. He said, we do this because the early church did this. Because Christ commanded. And the, the, the disciples followed the teachings of Christ. And we follow theirs. Which ultimately is the teaching of Christ. So absolutely, sound Bible preaching and teaching is essential. Otherwise, it's a false church. If they don't follow along with the doctrine of Christ and the apostles, if they don't follow sound uh, adherence to what God's word says, it is a false church. But that's not our main purpose either. How about praise and worship of God? Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and casteth their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created praise and worship of God Emphasize, emphasizing that a praise community a, a community of believers praising and worshiping God exalting the Lord through adoration and reverence. Praise and worship is clearly a central purpose of God's people. Just as it's always been a central activity in heaven is what we, we see described here. The place where both saints and angels will eternally sing the praises of God. And that's what we have to look forward to as believers. That's the promise is that we will eternally be able to worship and praise and sing the praises of God. Father of our Lord and Savior. It should, it should be a characteristic of every body of believers that, that there is. In some way, if you entered any church, praise should be going on. We do it here each Sunday. We praise Him through song. We praise his son and our savior, Jesus Christ's sacrifice through the communion that we take each day. We praise God's blessings and grace to us with the offerings that we take up or receive each day. We praise God's wisdom by the study of his word 
each time that we meet. You see, there's praise going on when we come through these doors, though we may not actively be thinking about it being an act of praise, but that's exactly what it is. And that's very important. But it's not our main purpose. None of these things separately represent the central purpose of the mission of the church in this world. The supreme purpose and motive for every individual believer, every body of Christ, the main purpose is a combination of all these activities. It's a combination of what we talk about, the fellowship. A combination of the, the praise and worship. It's a combination of the sound doctrine, preaching, and teaching. It's all of those things to do one main thing. And it has to do with glorifying God. That's why we come to church. That's the central and main purpose of the body of Christ is to glorify God the Father. And we do that through all of these other activities. The redemption of sinful men through the participation that people learn about the redemption plan that God has laid out so that they may also glorify God. And there's nothing that we can do that can glorify God on a higher level than whenever we, as the scriptures call us to do, begin to try to work toward people understanding God's great love for them. And the power and the work of Christ on the cross. And we can see that all of these things interact to point toward the glorification of God our Father. Abraham, that's when it began. If you want to turn back with me in Genesis, we're going to look at the some Old Testament scriptures here. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God telling Abraham as he called him. He says, And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's on the first day. The first time that God called and spoke and dealt with Abraham, or Abram as it was at that time, he had a plan for the redemption of all of the earth through Abram just through his obedience. And he says, I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to curse them that curse you. And you're going to be a blessing to all nations. And he had no idea, I'm sure at that point in time, what in the world he was talking about. But God knew exactly where his plan was going to end up. And he knew exactly the details of that was going to happen. And we can see that as we look on further over in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 23 and 24. It says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen. His marvelous works among all nations. See, he continuing to point toward the salvation of all people, all nations, the heathen, those that are without, outside of the Hebrew nation at that time, okay, which was everybody else but a Jew. But God's redemptive plan has always been pointed toward all nations. Psalm 18, you want to just continue to turn over there to your right. Verse 49, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and praise unto thy name. Great deliverance giveth he to his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed to David, and his seed forevermore. See that? His seed forevermore. And he has that plan. And all throughout the scriptures, we see that coming. We see that unfolding. But it's God's plan of redemption. And finally, Isaiah 49 6 and he said it shall be it, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be salvation unto the end of the earth See that? See that? It's, it's always been God's plan. 
that God would redeem those that would hear and obey. And that's why it's so important that all of these things that we do during the course of our worship, our fellowshipping, our sound preaching and teaching, praising and worshiping of God, so that we might bring glory to the God that has had a plan for us to be here this very day since Abram. Think about that. God had a plan for every Christian in this room to be here today since Abram in the Old Testament so that they could hear preaching, so that they could hear sound doctrine, so that maybe you're having a problem today and a brother or sister in Christ says the word or gives you a hug, a pat on the back, and you are encouraged and you're able to go out from here feeling better knowing that God loves you. And as the scripture said uh, this morning, be not afraid because God's with you. From the beginning of time, that's been God's plan for us. Why would we bring glory to God? Why would we not? When we look at his great love, his great power in that light, what else can we do but praise him and give him glory? It was always their purpose as the nation of Israel, Hebrews, God's people, however you want to refer to them. But the great mission has always been the salvation and redemption of all people. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across to them when he was here. That I had to use you as a vessel to, to accomplish this long-term goal. And that's the same way for us, folks. We're a vessel for God's long-term goal. We are a vessel for God's long-term goal. We don't think about it that way. But in the same way that Abram and all the other patriarchs of faith that continued to build in God's plan and God's plan was always pointing toward the redemption of all nations and all people. We are in the same way right in the nation of Gentiles, basically. We carry out that same plan for God's ultimate redemption of all people because he would have that none would, would perish. Scriptures tells us he wants everyone to come to salvation, everyone to come to repentance. Glory is to manifest, to see God's love manifested toward us. Redeem the loss. To send his son to pay the ultimate price that we may have hope. Because if we recall, what did Jesus say in Luke 19.10? I don't have the side up there, guys, if you're looking for it. He says, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what it says. Luke 19, 10. And he went on to say in John chapter 20, verse 21, that as the Father has sent me, I even send I you. Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Well, Rob, he's talking to the apostles. Yep, he sure is. But we follow the apostles' doctrine. We follow the same commands that Christ gave the apostles to go out and affect God's plan, his long-term ultimate plan. And if he sent the apostles and we have that knowledge of God's redemptive plan, then he sends us as well. Now, not everybody has the same job. We've seen that in Ephesians. Everybody got a different job, but rest assured, doing nothing is not a job. You have a job. You have a talent. I've never seen in the scriptures anywhere that says, and God did not bless this one because they weren't able. It's just not there. You have an ability to do something. We all have the ability to do something, to bring glory to God's kingdom, to be part of the long-term plan that he has had in place since the calling of Abel. And that's what we need to focus on. If we're not committed to winning the loss for Jesus, we should re-examine, first and foremost, our relationship with God. And you should look at, you should ask yourself that. And I encourage you to. And what I am doing is what I do help bring the lost to the knowledge of Christ. And you can plug that in on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, any day of the week you want to plug it in. 
but is what I do in the course of my life, does it bring glory to God? Does it reveal his redemptive plan to those that are lost? Because that's our function. That's our purpose. And if it's not your function and your purpose, then you're outside of what the obedience of Christ is supposed to be, the following after Christ. There's no middle ground there. There's no middle ground to that. We must be committed to our purpose and to seek and to save. I've asked several weeks. I've asked several weeks, did you pray for someone to be saved when you walked in this morning or on the way in today or last night in your prayers or while we were having prayer? Did you pray for a lost soul to be saved today? And, and maybe it's to the point that, that I've asked that enough that you're, you're, you're kind of like Peter when Jesus asked him the third time. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. But there's a reason. We have to get our mindset on what our main purpose is. And that's that the loss might come to salvation. That's our purpose. So certainly, fellowship, teaching, praise, all of those are preparation. Things that we use to bring glory to God. And it's just like in baseball. Practice is important. But practice should never be confused with the game. Practice is important, but it's never a substitute for the competition of the game. And it's great to have fellowship. It's great to have Bible teaching. It's great to have praise and worship in our service. It's essential. But if that's all that we're doing and we're not going toward the game, what our main function is, then is it as important at all? Who are we doing it for? We're doing it for us, right? It's just for me. It's for my own benefit. If we're not using all of these to bring glory to God, then I'm bringing glory to me. I'm checking off a box on Sunday. And that's never in the scriptures. So we have to be focused. We have to be focused. There might be someone here today who's lost, and I'm speaking directly to you if you're here, or if you're listening on Facebook or on YouTube later. God loves you, and he loves you so much he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come here first to be example to you, and then also that he die for our sins, which separate us from God, a holy God. And if you accept him as your Savior, if you hear and believe and you're willing to repent of your sins and confess Jesus Christ as Savior, and you're willing to be baptized, to wash away your sins, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, raise a new creation, and serve him faithfully until either Christ returns or until we're called away then. I offer that to you today. But it's not mine to offer. It's God's to offer. I'm just a, I'm just a servant. But I would help you. It would be my high honor to do that with you. Now, maybe you're already a Christian, and you realize, you know what? I've been, focus I've been focusing on things that, that are, though they're important, they're not the main goal. I've not really been a part of making sure that God's redemptive plan is carried out in my congregation or in my life. And I encourage you this morning to, to make a change on that. If you need to make a change, make a change. If you don't, Praise the Lord. Just keep doing what you're doing. Let's bring glory to God. Let's, let's pray for a lost soul to be saved. If not here, somewhere. In either case, we're going to sing this hymn of invitation this morning. I was going to say, as I always say, with the homecoming away, and I think Carolyn reminded me that today is the first day of fall or tomorrow is the first day of fall which brings our holiday season and let's think about how many people we're going to interact with in the next three months between now and the first of the year how many opportunities we're going to have to be just like what Abram was told a blessing to all nations can we be a blessing to all people that we encounter even those that upset us even those that 
make us want to do things that we shouldn't do <laughs> when we get upset and angry? Can we be a blessing to those people? Because that's what God's redemptive plan is. That's how we glorify God, the Father. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation 344, Come Unto Me, the first and the second verse. If you have a decision to make this morning, I want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing. Come unto me, 344, the first and second verse. <clears throat>